This Choircast podcast episode is brought to you by This Is Not Church podcast and the letter F. And you. <laughs> <laughs> if you've made it this far, my name is Nat Turney, my brother John Turney, and I co-host This Is Not Church, the podcast. And this is sadly the level of discourse that you can expect to find if you tune in every Monday when we drop new episodes. But all joking aside, John and I see this as, a, as an opportunity for us to address issues that we don't think are addressed nearly enough inside of evangelicalism. So LGBTQIA plus issues, BIPOC issues, social justice issues. We like to talk to a broad variety and range of people and really try to find places of commonality for everybody. So check out the podcast. Every Monday, our episodes drop. Wherever you stream podcasts, you can find us. Remember, this is not church. And to that, John says, Peace. Hey, heathens, you're listening to the Deadly Faith Podcast, where religion and crime collide. I'm Lola. And I'm Lacey. And this shit is barbaric. The mind that was in Jesus, that mind is in me. Without me, life has no meaning. Why would God tell you what I'm thinking and tell you what I've said to my wife or my husband when you're not around? It's because I'm the pastor of the church and I need to know. This is the only place where you can see truth. Ooh, that's a good word. I know. That's a good, it's like a good word, but not for the case that we're no. covering today. Today's case is heartbreaking. Yeah. yeah. Well, guys, we're so excited that you're here with us for another episode. And I know last week we had a guest. We also have another guest this week, and I'm so excited to introduce to you Jessica Lahore. She came on the podcast today, um, if you do not know her. She is a uh, drag queen, and they do so many performances, and they're amazing. And they have um, an Instagram, and we're going to tag it below so you can follow them. But Jessica, thank you for coming on the show and being here today. I'm so stoked. I really am. (laughs) Thanks for having me. I'm so excited. So if you don't, if you follow me on Instagram, this is how I met Jessica, is Jessica does this series called Ask a Drag Queen a Question, right? Is that what it's called? Yeah, Ask a Queen anything, ask a question. Yeah, ask a question. And so um, these people will come up and she does it on the streets and people ask her questions and stuff. And this one girl had asked her a question. And I think the girl had asked you about the lipstick color you were using, if I'm remembering (laughs) correctly. And then at the end of the series, she asked if she could pray for you. And she's praying for her. And I'm like cringing the whole time. And then all of a sudden, (laughs) the prayer was just so sweet and genuine and just like, asking for safety for you as you're, you know, on the streets doing this series. And I was like, whoa, breath of fresh air that like was not expecting that. And so I did a like duet of that video. Everybody loved it. It was a phenomenal. And that is how I met Jessica. We got tagged up and... I know, I slid into your DMs and said, hey. <laughs> you, so. said, hey. you said, hey. And nah. I was like, hey. Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, I've been obsessed with watching all of the uh, the questions that are asked. Because honestly, I a lot of them are questions that I've thought of in the past too. That mm-hmm. I just, it's, I don't know. Sometimes it feels uncomfortable to ask the question because you don't want to be. I'm going to stop you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And <laughs> I want you, but I feel like I have nothing to ever speak of now. I have no knowledge of words. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. Uh, I have to say, I just earlier today watched the one. I think you posted it yesterday or earlier today, uh, where the (laughs) the lady was like, "Tell me about Tuck." And I yes, that (laughs) one. (laughs) Yeah, she punished me with uh, a lesbian woman at my bingo, and I jokingly was like, "Hey, come ask me." So I'm gonna ask you about the Tuck. I was like, "Come find out your answer." So brought her over, and she's like, "I really don't know if I needed to know all of that." It was. Okay, but in all seriousness, I did not know that tucking was more than like I just had this envision of just like and it's gone. No, I did and too. There's so much more involved. It only snap the fingers and it just does what it needs to do. <laughs> but everything is so different. Those those three methods aren't even the vast majority of what other people can do. Oh them, so. my gosh, it's like a magic trick. It's like holy shit. Yeah, innovation it's, excites. It's amazing. I love that. Yeah, right. <laughs> 
Exactly. <laughs> uh, so we're going to present a case today. Lola's actually presenting for us today. And we're going to go over, of course, an LGBTQ-centered story, true crime case. Jessica, please, as we're telling this story in this case, jump in. We want to hear your perspective of um, like when you found out about this case or uh, just anything, anything. So feel free to jump in at any time as she's going through this case. After we get done, um, we're going to have just some questions for Jessica, just have a little shit chat. And of of course, we are going to leave all of their links in the description box below um, in the in the show notes, just so you guys know where to, to follow them at. And if you're local to them, go see one of their shows and, and bring your dollar dollar bills, y'all. Yes. You got you got you gotta tip those drag queens. Okay. <laughs> this is, get your coin. I, get your coin. <laughs> I have no makeup on right now because it's been Halloween. Of course, and I went as Beetlejuice. And so three times over the last week, I had to dress up and put makeup on. And I put makeup on regularly, but I did like thick makeup. And it's still a fraction of what you have on right now. And my face is like, don't you dare put one more damn thing on me right now. Like, give me a... (laughs) Was it raw? Completely raw makeup? It's not... It's not completely raw, but like, I think my eyes got irritated because I got something in one of them um, when I was taking it off and it like, it took a day for it to come out. And so my, I kept rubbing my eyes afterwards. And so I think my, my eyes were just like, no, ma'am. But it's November 1st, time to take it easy. Yes, <laughs> yes, exactly. We're shifting into sweatpants mode, you know? Yes. Comfy mode. Oh yeah. For sure. Comfy. All, all the coziness <laughs> for okay. sure. All right, Lola. Are we ready for story time? We are ready for story time. I I fucking cried today finishing my notes on this. Yeah, yeah this is a sad one. So we're talking about Matthew Shepard, which I didn't know anything about until like two months ago. Really? I'm not joking. Which is... You didn't. This is... I feel like it's common knowledge. So just ignore me and my smooth brain. I'm a smooth brain girl today. No, I feel like I'm not super late in life as well. I think that was later in my queerness as well. Like I still am learning things that I should probably know as a queer human or just as somebody in the community. And so I, I wouldn't take it to fall. You're learning it now. But. Yeah. How old are you, Jessica, if you don't mind me asking? I just turned 30. Okay. So you're similar to me. I'm 33. Just, uh, Lola's our baby. She's <laughs> 25 or are you 26? Yeah, I'm 25. 25. Okay. Yeah. You're still in the 90s yeah. though, right? Yeah. Yes. I was... I was born in 1990, and so we're all 90s babies. And so there was so much that happened prior to us even being born, and especially throughout the 90s that was just, we weren't aware of. We were still, you know, adolescents and stuff. And so there's a lot of this we just didn't know. We didn't grow up in it. See, that's where I blame it on. Like, all the history or, like, a lot of major plot points in history for the queer community happened in 70, 80, 90. And like, mm-hmm. I was born in 97, so I I was, I didn't know anything. Um, yeah. And, and also your household, how you were raised, like queer topics were not no. brought up <laughs> in my growing up whatsoever. Not even like the idea of kissing another boy was brought up in my house. Yeah. So of course these things weren't taught to me or clearly labeled as uh, big highlights or things to be aware of. Or right. Any, not even in school, not even in teaching. No, so. absolutely not. Where did you grow up? Grew up in the Midwest, uh, suburbs okay. of Chicago, then moved out to Colorado, went for eighth grade and stayed for college. Okay. And it, what, did you grow up in a religious household? Yeah, pretty strict Catholic. I wouldn't say like, okay. me, like I've met some really like mega strict Catholic families. Mine was more like, you uh, obey these rules and this is when you go to church and the thing, this is, you know, you go to classes to get confirmed. So we went through the steps, but still was not. Radical, yeah, or extreme. Gotcha. But still, same kind of homophobic beliefs and and doctrine. I remember my my family even like saying queer at somebody on the TV and not registering that 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 was not an okay thing. Like laughing with it because as a kid, I'm like, oh, that's funny. Yeah, they're they're queer and not getting the two. Oh, gosh. But I remember like that or even from my uncles or things growing up that I didn't catch until later in life. Right. I am going to, I'm sorry, Lola, I know no, you want to no, get no. started, but I want to ask if you don't mind sharing, how is your relationship with your family now that you are, I'm assuming, out and in and, yeah. and, and drag and stuff? I, I can't see it. <laughs> I can't see that coming out story being all that comfortable. No, I, I, when I came out, uh, it's been about a little bit 
close to five years oh, that wow. I haven't seen or spoken to my dad. My dad was very much a, no. uh, retracted all communication. And it's, it's very much a, not a feel bad thing. There's two adults here in this situation. I'm not choosing not to have a relationship. I can't go all the way though. Yeah. Uh, my mother has been, uh, we've met once and spoken once in four years. Oh my gosh. But my sisters are mega supportive. My extended family is, is decently supportive as well. So I've got I a lot of that. Yeah. I love it's that. I love that. That's it's good. 20 minutes from me. My parents live 20 minutes from me. And I don't have, yeah, wow. that's it. I haven't broken. That is so crazy. Oh my gosh. I grew up religious, but like not necessarily from my immediate family. So like my mom, my dad, things like that. Like they had their beliefs, but it was never like super religious or anything. But it was like from the community because I grew up in the Bible Belt. So Lacey was the one to seek out a cult. The cult didn't <laughs> find her. She found the cult. I did. I did. Oh, I found man. the cult and I like <laughs> full on joined. Oh, yeah. We had a covenant that we had to sign. I wasn't allowed to date. We did dances. We wore military. Your degree like, camel was pants chosen for we you. Were in God's army. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Oh, it's the yeah. whole different world. It, it was a whole, it was the whole shebang. My, my poor parents hated me being in it. <laughs> but when my brother's gay and when he came out at, when I was 16, my parents, my mom didn't have a great response. She still like socially was like, I, I did something wrong. Like I fucked him up. It was my parents thought. My dad's first thought was fear because we lived in the South in Texas. And he just begged my brother, don't come out till you graduate. Like, cause he was terrified that my brother was going to get killed. Yeah. 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 So uh, that's such a sad reality. It was. That was literally his only his only comment was don't come out till you're married till you're graduated. And, oh my god. And it was out of his fear and, and him still trying to grapple with understanding of it. Cause my dad's like, I mean, redneck is all redneck could be. But like over the years they've become very like open and like affirming. And when I came out and started deconstructing and walking away from religion, it was actually like a relief for my family. And they took you know, took me, not took me in, but like it strengthened our relationship. Uh, my sister is yeah, pansexual. My other brother's wife's pansexual. I came out as bisexual in like January of 2021, 2022. You don't count. You're with a man. Yeah, Remember, we <laughs> don't <laughs> count as bisexuals. <laughs> We're with men. <laughs> We're with men. We're with our golden retrievers. <laughs> and we're with a little sprinkle of, of, of a little bit of all the alphabet we here. Have, I swear. <laughs> and... and I, I can't say it, uh, exactly who it is, but I have another person in my family who's trans. And so I literally, I think I have the entire alphabet mafia <laughs> in my entire family. <laughs> it's awesome. I uh, love it though. But okay, without further ado, I'll quit interrupting. I could chat your ear off forever. Speaking of safety though, you know, kind of <laughs> circling back to that with not I wanting someone to... It's important to go into the stories or into the case. Yeah, so. good segue. No, yeah, yeah. Um, so... Matthew Shepard. Yes. I just want to give some background on him first. So he was the oldest of his siblings. He had he had two other siblings. Uh, he was born on December 1st, 1976. He was a preemie, a little baby. He was a oh very like petite person. Yeah. Just e- even as a full-grown person, just very like Adult. small and petite and like like a little fairy. <laughs> <laughs> He's so handsome, too. Super handsome. He was so cute. I swear. I've seen pictures. The pictures that we'll post. I mean, I just... Yeah, no. I was a photo for this. He's very, very handsome. Yeah. Yeah. If we would have been in a grade together, I'd have been like, I can turn you straight to <laughs> date me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And like, so when he was a kid, he was just like super empathetic. He loved everybody. He loved church, firstly. He loved everybody. He didn't, he cared for like anyone that was being bullied or that was just in a tough situation. He was polite and respectful, just all the things that a good, decent human should be. I've worked a lot in Wyoming and there's a lot of queer, like like religious people in Wyoming. Yes. It's not very as uncommon to hear that in Wyoming. Yeah. And yes, he's from Wyoming. I was just about to say he's from Wyoming. Grew up. In the Catholic, no, I lied. We were talking about Catholics earlier and it got me off track. Episc- Episcopalian? Episcopal? Yes, Episcopalian. Uh, he was an Episcopalian. He was part of the Episcopal Church. Yeah. Yes. So that's where he grew up, which 
I knew nothing about Episcopalian things till recently, but a lot of their beliefs are affirming. Yes. So that's nice. They, became, they officially <laughs> became affirming. Don't take my word for it, but I'm pretty sure it was like 1979. Their organization as a whole became LGBTQIA affirming and um, really like pushed like civil rights issues and things like that. So yeah, a lot of like universalist ideas. Yes. Which is great. I'm all here for it. <laughs> yeah, same. Yeah. So he wanted to make the world a better place. He would like debate you on politics and on social structures, even as a young kid. But like... Oh my God, I love that. He would like fight you, be like, fuck you, agree with me. He just like, he kept an open conversation. He wanted to keep talking about the hard things and, um, yeah. you know, just leave the world better than when he found it. So he saw everybody as an equal. Beautiful. I just love him. Love that. I'm very, I'm very upset after hearing this. And I know it was so long ago, like literally my whole lifetime ago, but, mm-hmm. it, but it makes me so sad. We, but we have to still continue, even though it was long ago, we still have to continue having this conversation and telling these stories because it's still happening. It's still <laughs> happening. And the media runs with this, you know, homophobia, transphobia shit like crazy. Mm-hmm. And it puts people in danger and people are dying and things are continuing to happen with hate crimes. So it's like, even though this was so long ago, we still have to, unfortunately, continue having this conversation. Mm-hmm. It's gotten worse in yeah. the last couple of years. I feel like there was a, a, maybe a lull of, of emphasis on queer people. It was mm-hmm. not as prominent of a conversation unless somebody happened to be gay and they were running for a position. And now it's any, it's a little bit more heated. Anyone that's trans, anyone that's queer, anyone that is mm-hmm. too, anyone that's dressed different, and you, you know, just... It's it, anyone wearing a rainbow flag, even if they're an ally, it's very, it's getting, it's violent. Yeah. It, it just, in the same ways. It's like Trump came into office and he like, it, like his bigotry was so prominent that it just like gave everybody else permission to let their just bigotry fly out of their mouth no matter where they were at. And yeah, hate just, crimes against it, the community, the queer community actually spiked after 2016. So yeah, like, they, not you were right about the lull, Jessica, happening. Mm-hmm. Um, in like the 2010s. Okay, really. Mm-hmm. And so it, it, they made it okay. Yeah, yeah. And then the Titans murders of trans individuals is more. And it's it's just been a very rough couple of years if you think about it. It's yeah. the same thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So Matthew, uh, his parents said they suspected him as being queer, but they just didn't say anything. That They said it was just small things in his childhood. I don't know. Nothing that was it, like too <laughs> forward though. No, they have inklings. They really do. Do they? Oh, oh I yeah. Think they do. And a lot of them block out the inkling or they try to like correct it if they don't want it to happen. Uh, like, how, how do you embrace the inkling? Is the inkling like, oh, I don't care. You tell me when you're ready. I think this is cute. I'm not going to judge you. Or is the inkling, I think he, this person might be queer. I better stop this now and get that mm-hmm. queer feet out of your brain. Like, where are we going with this? Yeah. yeah. And it's and it's not just parents. Like, even people within the community, within your school, they know. Like, my brother said he knew that he was gay from his earliest memory. And when he was in elementary, he was being made fun of for being gay. And he didn't come out until after he graduated. He came out to me when I was 16. So I think it was like his senior year, junior year, something like that. He came out to me and like, we all knew. Like, and when I when I asked him, I was just like, oh, okay, you know, like I knew. I'm just waiting for you to finally tell me, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, he came out to them when he was a teenager and they just kind of like shrugged it off. They're like, okay, we like, we don't care. Whatever. We still love you. Which, (laughs) thank God, (laughs) we don't get that response too often. So I was like, (sighs) I mean, I know now that they have all these other projects going and they're affirming their allies. They're all for the support of LGBTQIA plus things. But Mm -hmm. somehow when I was looking into this, I was like, oh, my God, they're going to say, go away. Or something. Because that response is so common. Yeah. That that's what we just automatically assume is could possibly happen. His parents are such yeah. wholesome people. I just want to shake really their are. hands. Give them I a wanna hug. I want to hug them. <laughs> um, I know folks that hate them and go to do the benefit regularly and say they're the most kind, kind people. That oh, I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> 
I'm fine. Know. I'm not crying. You are. <laughs> <laughs> Heads up to everybody listening. We're recording at a much different time than we normally do, which we are all here for, and that's totally fine. Um, but like my kids are still up, so you might hear like stomping in the background. Um, I'm not going to put An it on our editor's scream. shoulders. Yeah, I'm not going to put it on our editor's shoulders to try to get that out. So like, you're just going to go down this road with us. Our dogs are still, you know, up and this going. So This is raw. Just join us for this wild ride <laughs> in this episode, okay? <laughs> raw dog and you. <laughs> What's wrong with me? <laughs> we have changed course of conversation. It's too much. Yeah. <laughs> So, on the same page as Raw Dogging, he studied, studied political science in college. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Um, uh, but he like he wanted to become a diplomat for the Department of State. I don't know what that means. Oh, I have no me idea what neither. that means. It sounds very prominent and yeah. very important. So, like you could make a change. Yeah. Is what, okay. Like That's what I'm thinking. Change. Yeah. yeah. So he did super well in school, like high school and in college. He was just like well adjusted socially. He was overall a happy person, had healthy relationships. And in college, he was involved with a, a group called the LGBTA group. And um, uh-huh. it's lesbian, gay, bisexual, trans. The A does. No, it stands for like the group. Asexual. Name. Like it's not what it, agency, maybe? <laughs> Yeah, association, that was it. Like, yes, like association. association. So, that group, association. So okay. On yeah, the yeah, campus, yeah. the campus yeah. that he went to was uh, affirming to, they just like helped create a safer environment pretty much for any any kids on campus um, that identified as queer or part of this group. So you need to have a university during that time frame to, to, to have something that is in that area in Wyoming. I think that's pretty impressive. I, I agree. On October 6th, he was actually with this group and they had just had one of their like meetings and they went out to eat together. They were just hanging out, super chill. And then after the meeting, there was a a girl in the group. I don't know her name, but she was like, oh, I'll give you a ride home to Matthew. So, um, and I'm going to call him Matthew and Matt all through this. It's okay. Interchangeable. We'll roll with it. Because his parents said both, so... Now I have that in my notes. So anyway, so she took Matthew home, but then decided to change course. He was like, oh, actually, I kind of want to go to this lounge, the fireside lounge. So she dropped him off there. No big deal. Mm -hmm. But then 18 hours later, uh, someone that was riding a mountain bike crashed their bike and looked around them and saw on uh, on a rail spike fence thing that there was something that looks like a scarecrow possibly and it it's near Halloween like it's in, in October so it's like makes sense but you know we always say like if you think it's a mannequin it's it's not a mannequin you think it's it's never something a mannequin. fake it's probably not take a closer a look mannequin. and this person thankfully did and it was Matthew Shepard who had been left out there in the freezing cold without shoes and he was mm. bloodied like mutilated bloodied so this person oh immediately gosh. was freaking out saw that he was still breathing but it was like very labored breathing and he ran to a yeah. nearby house and had someone to call 911 and at this point Matt was already in comatose state oh my gosh and did you say he was tied to the fence? Yeah, he was tied. He was tied to the fence. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. And I correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure from what I remember, the fence is one of those like old school, like think of like a cattle guard. I'm going to talk type about fence. it. Oh, you're going to talk about it? Okay. 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 I'm jumping ahead. I'm so sorry. See, this is why it's better when I don't know the case <laughs> because then I don't interrupt Lola very much. <laughs> so, policewoman Reggie Flutie was the first on the scene. Love the last name. I hope I said it right, but Love it. yeah. So uh, she recalled that after they had cut him down, finally, uh, Matt was mm-hmm. on his back and his arms were behind him still, and his respirations were were still super labored. And she said, "I thought he was like seventeen, fifteen, seventeen, because he was so small." Yeah. She attempted to open his mouth to clear his airway, but it was like clamped shut. I don't know medically oh why this. I, it's got to do with the coma, probably. But she literally couldn't like 
unlock it. Or the way he was attacked. He was attacked. There could be that's true. Yeah. The attack, the cold, said, yeah. like coma, all these things were probably the reason why combination. And if like it was, if he like because he was attacked so brutally that all of that swelling that had oh, set yeah. in over those hours, that's true. You know, it could have just locked something shut for um, sure. So yeah, for sure. Yeah. So she said that she had told him. Baby boy, I'm here, kiddo. You're going to be okay. Hang in there. Don't give up. Come on, you can do this. Tears. That's when I started fucking crying in my notes because... I remember I remember that quote. Uh, oh. Um, the manner of his killing was uh, compared to... Like, his injuries were that of, like, a, a brutal car accident kind of thing. Um, I mean, it was oh bad. Gosh. Uh, the New York Times actually likened this whole uh, him being tied to that fence as a Western custom of nailing a dead coyote to a fence to ward off intruders. That's disgusting. Apparently, that's like a common thing to do. In And you're in cowboy country uh, where they're at, you know, Wyoming. So, Oh, my gosh. It's called a buck fence. The, and we'll have a picture of it so you can see it. It's like, it's an angled fence that has like spiked kind of wood on both sides. So uh, it's it's weird and I've never seen it before. I assume it's just no. mostly in... They're common. Yeah, they're common out. Cowboy in the, country. Especially in like Wyoming. Yeah, real deep cowboy yeah. country and stuff like that. I, I think they're mostly to like keep cattle in and something. D- correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know. We had electric fences is how they kept the cows in where I was. That's all the I've ever noticed the electric ones, but that fence where he was bound and uh, killed is gone. So if you want to try to see okay. the site, it's going to be hard to find. So the police had a really hard time trying to cut him free because his wrists were tied super tightly with clothesline, which <gasps> if you... No clothesline. It's super thin material. So it cuts skin. Like the thinner the material, the more likely it is to cut off circulation and cut into the skin versus like a thick rope. So they were trying to like shove a knife up in between it and they were having a hard time like not hurting him further. Pretty much. Oh my God. Um, Eventually, they they did That's get insane. it off of him. He was um, bound, like, at his feet. His hands were behind him, and then his chest was tied up, too. Um, and his head was just kind of limp. Ugh. Uh, some people had reported that he was in the crucifixion stance. That was not true, though. His mom okay. uh, rectified that statement and said that was just, like, publicity um, stunt. People trying to... It's like clickbait, pretty much, but that never happened, which is so gross. Why would you? Yeah, it is trying to make it worse than what it was, but exactly, it's worse enough. He was soaked. Oh my god, I'm not gonna cry. I'm not laughing because it's funny. I'm, I'm doing the uncomfortable. Like I'm not gonna cry. I'm laughing because I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah, Bailey Sarian vibes. So he was like soaked in his own blood. Um, except for one streak down his face on his cheek where a tear had run downward. <sighs> he was mutilated. He was unrecognizable. Oh my like, gosh. The only way his parents could identify him when they first saw him was he had braces at the time and part of his like lip had exposed that. And then one of his eyes was open too, like slightly open. And they saw his like, coloring of his eyes and they were like that's that's our boy I they uh they had to see him in that state I can't as a not be able to unsee uh-uh. that ever yeah you can't you absolutely cannot unsee that and like as a mother I cannot imagine having to see one of my children in that state and then never never getting that image out of my head. For sure. Yeah. I, I hate that they had to see him like that, but I am glad that they were able to see him before he passed and he did hold on. So um, his parents were living in Saudi Arabia at the time, which is a 33 hour flight uh, to oh, get yeah. from there to there. And yeah. yeah. 
but they flew wow. like right there yeah. as soon as they got the call. They said they received the call around 5 a.m. their time that Matt was in the hospital in Laramie, and they were told to come immediately, and they weren't given any details. 33 hours of just... Exactly. Saying, I know nothing about what is happening to my child other than that it is life-threatening and I need to go. 33 hours dealing with that, not to mention the other people that you're trying to deal with and try to keep sanity of any kind. Absolutely. And not only that, you're sitting there and you're like on a plane. There's no communication. This is the late 90s. There's no communication on the planes. And so like, I would be sitting there like, okay, did something happen further? Is it getting worse? I don't know. Nobody can contact me. And 33 hours, like the furthest flight that I've ever done was to um, Australia. New Zealand. I went from how long was that? California to New Zealand, and that was I can't remember. It was like eighteen hours, okay. twenty hours. I can't remember. It was so wow. long ago. It was over. It was like thirteen years ago. So it was a long time ago. But like that was exhausting enough. So like thirty three, all while my child is in the hospital and I don't know what's going on. Oh my god! Just take <laughs> me out now. I yeah. They uh, thought it was a car crash from like the way that people were speaking to them on the phone before they got on their plane and everything. I mean, yeah, how much can you give them also without... Yeah. Like, it, this balance of like, okay, well, I need to get you here immediately. And also, I don't... How do I tell you what happened to your kid right now? See, and I had wondered why they weren't up front with them, but it makes sense where it's like, they probably... I don't know what's worse, like the anticipation of not knowing the knowledge that you need to know or knowing how severe it is and that he's barely hanging on. Honestly... I think they did it smart. That was a smart way that they did it because if they would have said, we found your son tied to a fence and brutally beaten, my mind would have went through for the 30 hours. What did my child go through? How did this start? Why was he attacked? It would have gone down this major rabbit hole. Yeah, and then in the other side, you're just worrying, oh, how bad is it? He was in an accident. There's not that hate-filled you know, aspect probably coming into her head. Maybe it could have, who knows? But uh, yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, he had to be, so during their flight, he had to be sent to a different hospital that had more research, resources because this one didn't have all the uh, things to to treat the the types of injuries that he had. So he was taken to a different hospital in Denver, Colorado. So his parents arrived in Denver, Colorado and were immediately swarmed with press. Can you imagine? Are you fucking kidding me? Like, everyone's in their face saying, like, how do you feel I, about what happened to Matt? How do you feel? How do you feel? And it's like, what? The press knows more about the situation than you do. Yeah. Yeah. You're the last one to find out kind of thing as a parent. Yeah. yeah that, it's got to be hurtful. I, it, I swear, this is, I'm going to say it again like I always do. I wish I believed in hell because there would be a special place in hell for these motherfuckers, Just for the press. These little paparazzi, publicity, press shit. They get, a, they get their own division because that's just somebody in that state finding out something about their child and you're shoving a mic in their face telling them to speak. Like, you son of a bitch. Like, mm. yeah. I, I feel that if I had been there, I would have been violent with the press. Yeah, I, they'd have caught these hands. <laughs> yeah. God damn. For sure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so anyway, that everyone knew what happened, but them, so they finally get in there and the physicians that are attending finally say what happened or what they know of his injuries. You know, they were able to identify him, like I said, because of the races and um, his yeah. eye coloring and um, I think a birthmark. And... She said that he was just so swollen and bruised and his fingers were curled up in that comatose state. And uh, the physicians (sighs) told them, you know, he probably is not going to wake up. But if he does, he's not going to be the mad that you knew at all. So they're kind of just in this weird, I don't want to say limbo because they didn't really have a choice either way. But they're just in this weird, confused, sorrowful, angry state, you know. He had suffered 18 to 21 blows to the head, and he had four skull fractures. One of them had crushed his brainstem. <gasps> How is he still alive? He was, he was hanging on with one breath. Yeah. That was what he was. That's it. I really feel like he hung on just for his parents to see him, you know, because like 
and I, he, I, I don't know what comatose state all entails, but I know they say sometimes they can still hear you. So possibly that was it. But and I've heard so many stories of people like on like on their deathbed and they hold on for so long until that one person gets there or until that one family member tells them we will be okay. Yeah. Pass on. And then they're like it's like they sink into it and then before you know it they've passed on. So it's like I would believe that. I feel like Matt did that. I mean, he loved his parents, he loved his family, and I think he knew that this was going to wreck them you know, like completely devastate everyone around him. So I'm fast forwarding a little bit, but I'll come back to Matt and his injuries and everything. So a few days after this whole incident with Matthew, um, a report came in about two men that were fighting beside a truck and police were called to just check in. And those two were Russell Henderson and Aaron McKinney. Stupid names. The worst names. They're just just stupid names. The worst. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So the truck used to belong to Aaron's father and was given to him. There was a coat in the back of the truck with blood in it. So like the officers were just kind of like peering into the truck. They didn't go into it. Mm -hmm. And a pair of black shoes. These shoes were Matthew's. The ones that they stole off of him. They stole his shoes. They stole his shoes off his feet. Mm -hmm. Pathetic human beings. There was also a credit card on the dash from Hilltop National Bank with the name Matthew Shepard on it. These are some fucking idiots. When they saw that, and like the media is swarming about a Matthew Shepard that's in hospital currently, they called in and were like, hey, we got to search this person's vehicle right now. Yeah. Smart, smart police work here. So they did find a gun, and it was the one that was used to strike Matt. So it was a Smith & Wesson 357 Magnum covered in hair and blood on the butt of the gun. So they had pistol whip. Oh my gosh, they pistol, pistol, pistol whip. And if you you don't know what pistol whipping is, you can go watch Goodfellas, and they have a scene for what pistol whipping is. So. Oh my God. It's the worst. These Guys were literally so stupid. Like, I'm glad they were stupid. Me too. (laughs) And didn't get rid of any of the evidence, but like, Jesus Christ, guys. Good job being dumb. All the details came together, though, you know, with all that they found uh, the rest of like Matt's wallet and everything. Mm -hmm. And and they sent off all of the evidence for uh, testing. And it was confirmed that it was his blood and his hair. So they were the main suspects. They were arrested. Henderson remained silent, and McKinney immediately asked for an attorney. All right. So, October 6th, backing back up to the night okay. that this all happened, once Matthew was dropped off at the Fireside Lounge, a bartender came forward and told police that he saw Matthew with two males who were identified as both McKinney and Henderson, that they were, like, talking, and they got drinks and stuff, and they all left together. So they weren't actually arrested Henderson and McKinney weren't actually arrested right as they found all that evidence on them. If you can believe it, they were arrested a little bit later. I don't know why this was. That makes sense. That doesn't make sense because they, he, they had Matthew Shepard's car, like credit cards. Like, so that is yeah. physical evidence. Like Blood. Yeah, confirmed evidence. At least like the blood and the hair, like that takes DNA, that takes know, testing, that takes time. <laughs> but you would have enough to arrest him and 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 charge him with like something like I know we're not cops but like I'm sorry they I feel like they could have see and I don't know what the like process was back in the day but I feel mm-hmm. like it, it should be similar to what it is now yeah I don't know I'm not a I'm not a police officer but first Henderson was arrested at like his residence and then McKinney he actually couldn't be arrested that same day because he was in hospital due to injuries because he had been out fighting and he was being treated for injuries. Oh, wow. The car you said that the cops searched, wh- whose was that car? It was, uh, it belonged to McKinney's father. So Aaron McKinney's father. So it was... Okay. 
That's oh. why they couldn't arrest him because it was not in one of their vehicles. Mm. It was in the father's vehicle. So they couldn't arrest them because then they had to do the trace of like who actually okay. had these items. Where did they come from? It makes from? sense. Okay. It makes yeah, sense. I'm, I'm okay. tracking now. So October yeah. 8, two days after Fireside Lounge incident, both of their girlfriends are interviewed. So McKinney and Henderson's girlfriends are interviewed um, and they provide shaky alibis. They both say, oh, they were home all night with us. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That's a new one. <laughs> so we got on the same smart pattern of evidence and any kind of information. They're still on the same good trek of just giving themselves up. So Yes, exactly. That's like the same... Like, I hear that alibi so many times. It's the same, like, uh, I was just supposed to, like, to leave the dog at my, my homework. homework. Okay. <laughs> Get creative. <laughs> Innovation site. Uh, so the... Girlfriends were arrested for accessory after the fact and potential murder. And they said, hey, we're actually going to like have you tried and convicted of the murder charge if you don't say something, like speak up. And so the girls cracked. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Thank God. I would too. (laughs) Fuck that. (laughs) One of them said that McKinney came home covered in blood and said that he killed somebody. Uh, I know. It's... I know. Flat out. And so so you just stayed? I wonder if it was fear. I, uh, I wonder how violent, like, uh, if, if they're going out fighting and stuff, it could have been like a domestic violence situation where she just was like, if I say anything, I'm going to be dead next. Yeah. And that is the only way that I could understand the situation. But if it was, there was no violence, excuse me, from his part to her, and then like, I'm sorry, you coming home covered in blood and telling me you killed somebody? I'm out. Okay, oh, do it in 30 minutes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah. Uh-uh. No. Power. No, like, what kind of response? Yes, get out. Right, yeah. No, that's true. You don't know if it was a domestic violence. I, I can only assume. That's the only way I could I could understand it. If they're this violent, then it's not much of a stretch to us to assume that it most likely was probably violent in their relationship. Even if you weren't in a domestic violence situation from the get-go, imagine your significant other coming home covered in blood saying, I think I just killed somebody. Uh I think you'd be inclined to believe that like they may be in a state where they would hurt you even if they haven't hurt you before. Uh So, And especially for women that are like, if if your significant other is a man, you statistically like... You could be more on edge, you know? For so, sure. I could, I could see that. Henderson's tennis shoes were hid in a storage unit, and they were also covered in blood. The, one of the other girlfriends knew about that. And she just said, I think, I think they're in the storage unit. They were. They also confessed that Matt's wallet, so I said they found, like, his wallet. They didn't find it in the truck. They found it at a later time. She said, specifically, <sighs> Specifically, that it's in a Walmart bag inside of a used diaper. Oh, my God. What? The anger. <laughs> the can, the what? Can you imagine being the cop that's like, what the fuck? You gonna make me open a goddamn diaper because that's where you decided to hide it? Like, I was about to say, was it poopy what? or was it pee? <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope it was just pee. But you're saying they hid it, right? Yeah, they had hid it like in one okay. of their apartments. They are seriously so fucking stupid. Why are you holding on to all of this evidence? I have a feeling that like... brain cells to rub together. I think that um, maybe like in the whole... Kerfuffle. Debacle that was happening. They like... Because they took his wallet from him. I'll get into that in a Mm -hmm. minute. I think that he may have shoved it in his pants and then like began the whole violence thing and didn't mm. think about the wallet until he got home. And then he's like, oh, shit. And she's like, I'll just, I'll just put it over here. Here in a diaper. Oh my God. <laughs> Why are you British? What's happening? I don't know. <laughs> but also, his credit cards, so they're also using it. Exactly. Like, mm-hmm. They really thought very little of Matthew. None of this <laughs> was thought through and they thought little of him. Exactly. Yeah. Disgusting. Agreed. The men ended up being charged with attempted first-degree murder, 
And the girlfriends were charged with just accessory after the fact. And Matthew's friends, unfortunately, you know, that LGBTQ group he was part of, they were all bombarded by media, also asking, how do you feel? How do you feel? How do you think I feel, bitch? Right. I was just about to say the same thing. My friend's dead. What are you expecting me to say? I feel like sunshine and rainbows. Like, what the hell? So let me... I'm going like in a weird order with this, but I promise it makes sense. So there's footage of Aaron McKinney walking into the courtroom and he is smirking. He is proud of what he's done. <sighs> oh my God. I'm. Fu- it just, the balls on this guy. I just can't. So he said that he and Henderson went into Fireside Lounge um, and targeted Matthew. Mm. So they were there for a specific purpose. Specifically, yeah. Was Fireside, was it a gay gay lounge? Okay. Yeah. Or was it just like LGBTQ? We had had to pose as being queer in some way. Okay. It's more, yeah, it's more queer leaning. Anybody's welcome. But like, it was a safe space for the most part. Yes, okay. So they said that they went into the bathroom and they created a plan to pretend to be gay and they were going to lure Matthew into the truck. Um, And so they befriended him and said, you know, we're going to a party. Do you want to come with us? And he's had a great night. He's been out with friends. He's at this new lounge, made some friends. He's like, heck yeah. Let's not let the fun stop. I agree, Matthew. This is not a bad plan. So he agreed and got in the truck with them. McKinney said that Matthew made a move on him, like put his hand on his thigh. Oh, no. And that's why they resulted to violence. This was not true. This did not happen in the slightest. uh, Yeah. Not at all. Matthew didn't do jack shit (laughs) at all. No. And even if he did, he didn't deserve to die. I just want to, I just want to say that. Just. Oh, my gosh. I just, you know. You know how in like horror movies where like the girl is going to go, you know, around the corner or go up the stairs and you're like, no, don't do it. Like, because you know what's coming. It's like I envision Matthew getting in their truck and I'm just like, no, get out, get out, don't get in, don't get in. I know. (sighs) It's not your fault, Matthew. I understand. No, not at all. You just wanted some new friends. But these guys, okay, even if he even did. If he, even if he did put a pass on him, there's, yeah. be, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're in a queer space, they obviously played a part to make him feel like they, they were They were too flirting boring. with him. They were like playing into it, right? Exactly. So yes. if he made a pass and he said, oh no, I'm sure Matthew would not have continued doing anything. But that's also a way to just yes. be like, hey, are you interested in rolling around or something like yeah exactly that's why i'm like you you can't sit there and pretend to be gay and and lead this guy on and then him put his hand on your thigh and then be like oh hell no now you have to die like they decided that beforehand they decided that Mm -hmm. he was gonna when they went into the bathroom they immensely played the part absolutely what were they gonna do when they got him in the car just drive him around Mm -hmm. or make fun of him or Something, no, they planned to hurt him. Maybe it made it worse. Maybe they they did more things because of it, but they planned on abusing him and hurting him anyway. Yeah. So the reason that they said that, is it, Lola, is it because like um, if premeditated murder has a, a higher like sentence, a longer sentence? And so. Yeah. So they were going for the gay panic defense, which like can hold up in a court of law even to this day, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Um, not in every state, but like, eh, whatever. So yeah. Yeah, they they were just trying to build onto a gay panic defense. So, yeah. What really happened is that they got Matthew into the truck with them. And then while they were driving, they were like already going to like a remote kind of area. And they told him, we aren't going to a party. Uh, you're jacked. Give us your money. And then they hit him across the face. And so he was like giving them, he's, here's my wallet. It only had like 20 bucks in it. And then his card from the bank. And so they ended up stopping at that field where that fence was. They pistol whipped him over and over until like he like couldn't fight back. And then they tied him up to the fence, tied his hands and everything. And then they beat him specifically in the face, which if... I guess if anyone doesn't know this, but like if you're being attacked in the face, 
shot in the face, it normally means that they're like attacking your soul. Like the hatred is so deep, they hate exactly who you are. The fight of you. Yeah. Oh, I'd never heard that before, but that makes a lot of sense. You know, so um, like deeply loathe the essence of your spirit, who you are. Golly. So absolutely horrible. And they didn't know him. They oh, did no, not yeah. know him at all. So they, they are, He had never met them prior. Nothing. They have nothing to hate Mm-mm. besides the fact that he's, he's gay. A, so, yeah. like, exactly. Like, this was beyond if a hate crime. If, if it wasn't him, they probably would have picked somebody else. They planned to hurt somebody in that bar, mm-hmm. regardless. And he was probably alone. Mm-hmm. I have a feeling what? that, like, maybe they targeted him right as he came in. You know, they were like, yeah. oh, that one's by mm-hmm. himself. He doesn't really yeah. look like he knows anybody here. You and know? he's small. And he's small. And, so they, and easy. Mm-hmm. You were going to say something, Jessica? I think we interrupted you. No, I I, said yeah. it, I, I think okay. it was just like somebody planned. If, if it was not him, somebody was going to. And you're right, he was alone. He was smaller. And there's no excuse that you can think of it that they were going to hurt somebody. I can't think of anything else that they would, would be planning to do. Yeah, and the fact that the other guy was like picked up for fighting two days later. Like, it mm-hmm. was, this was just in their nature. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so they were being held at a detention center and McKinney actually sent a letter over to Henderson. It never reached him because law enforcement intercepted it. Um, <laughs> right. Where he was pretty much saying like, I'm responsible for everything and told Henderson, you need to pin this all on me because like, you're a good kid. I made you do, like, I made you tie him up, but you didn't hit him. So this is all in the letter. It's all yes. in the letter. <laughs> They're so okay. fucking st- so stupid. stupid. <laughs> yeah, let me write this letter from my detention center to, and see if anybody reads it or opens it before they deliver it to mm-hmm. you. Even yeah, trial. very smooth brain boys. Smooth brain, yes. no wiggles, no squiggles, none at all, no squiggles. I, I love it when they're this stupid. I mean, it is a open and shut case and it makes the job a lot easier. It makes our taxpayer dollars go a lot further because they're not having to work mm. as hard to put all this together. Say more. And they're like, yeah. they're putting themselves in jail at this point, but and it makes for some comedic relief moments, but Lord. If he came in with the smirk on his face, there has to be a, a sense of pride. Like yeah. you said, this, uh, mm-hmm. like maybe I, I'm not, I'm purposely not hiding things because I want people to know what I did. I don't mm-hmm. know. And if that's just a different perspective. Maybe they're just as stupid as we think they are, but coming in happy about the work that he's accomplished, then it's very possible that, 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 that he wanted to get caught in some way. Yeah. Like pin it, all, pin it all on me. I'm okay with pinning it all on me. Uh, yeah, you're a good kid, but I'm leaving all these these pieces of evidence out. I'm obviously not. Maybe he's smarter in that sense. He wanted people to know there's joy in getting caught. There's joy yeah. seeing your face all over the media as a killer sometimes. Yeah, easily. We've talked we've talked a lot about different killers who literally relished in the media frenzy of their killings. Like the, one of the most popular ones, BTK. I don't know if you know anything about that case, but um, it was back in the 70s and 80s. But he would literally communicate anonymously with the cops and the media about his crimes and take ownership of it. Like he finally started doing that because somebody else took ownership of, of his mass murder of, of a family. And he was like, oh, hell no, I want the recognition and like he named himself and everything so like that is um, very common and easily could be you know, he relished in the attention he was getting from the murders the murder I mean we're looking at even currently people do that nowadays I'm proud to have gone on January 6th I'm proud oh my to god yes it. The amount of pride that people, you know, I, yeah, I'm going to get in trouble, but I did this because it was for the right thing or whatever, whatever the intention is. And people want to be seen and known that they represented something. It's, it, you know. Yeah. I actually know somebody that was there on January 6th. Shut up. Oh. You do not. I do. Yeah. I it everything. Was, uh, <laughs> it was my um, elementary crush, like one of my like no. younger ones. Like, oh, yeah. I wanted to marry this boy so bad. Yeah. And before January 6th, they asked to be my friend on Facebook. This was like like a maybe a year before this. Mm-hmm. And I was like looking at their profile and I started laughing because I definitely had one of those whoo, dodged a bullet type moments. And then literally January 6th, I saw them make a post about being there. I don't think that they went to the Capitol or anything. 
Uh, but it wouldn't shock me if they did. But, you know, I grew up in the South, so, you know. <laughs> Not shocking. Thank you. I hate it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I do too. I literally hate I it. I do. Well, mm-hmm. just to like add on to this letter too, he called Matthew a fag in the letter. <gasps> no, he didn't. So that's gross. Very. Also, he wrote another letter. So he's really, he's a writer. McKinney, I see you. He wrote to another inmate's wife? <laughs> Question mark? What? <laughs> Question marks? <laughs> I also have no idea, like, what was happening there. Um, yeah. But he said, being a, a very sick, <laughs> drunk, homophobic something, I, I can't read what he said, I flipped out and began to pistol whip the fag with my gun ready at hand. This is what he said to McKinney, or is this what he said to his... This is what he wrote to that inmate's wife. The inmate's wife. What? I, again, up to show off pride. Right. Yeah. I think that Attention. he was He was trying to just like... I don't know if it's this whole like, oh, I'm I'm a man's man, and like... Look what, mm. I, see what I did? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, that's what it kind of strikes me as. To- toxic toxic really masculinity really at its finest. Yeah. Her. Yeah. Trying yeah. to prove himself to her. I don't know. Maybe. I see, I don't know if it was romantic. That I still have questions on that. I'm like, who is she? What is happening? I know. That's, um wow. I have But else. both of the letters <laughs> pretty much said like he had every intention of killing him. That I think they thought he was dead when they left. So I'm sure. Henderson pled guilty and the death penalty was taken off the table. And he is still serving life in prison without the possibility of parole. McKinney uh, also pled guilty and was sentenced to two life terms. So his was even longer because he was the one that claimed that he did the pistol whipping um, and seemed to be the, like, mastermind behind this whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but law enforcement that was involved, they just kind of summed it up by saying, like, they were just fucked up kids. You know, like, they were were kind of young and... They were on mess, and they lived in cowboy country, and they hated gays. Like, um, there was no grand, like, mission here besides eliminate yeah. a gay person. Yeah. Like, no greater cause at hand. This person hadn't offended them personally, like, done something against them. They it just did. They exactly. do what? He, he existed. Yeah, he, he was existed. punished for existing around people mm-hmm. that did not want him to exist. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was yes. it. So that's it for them. Locked away. So if you want to write them a letter. Mm. No. Apparently their letter no. forward. No. No. No, don't do that. Ew. Or make a donation in their name to a homo or like a homosexual forward cause, you know? Yes. Let's do that. Okay. So uh, Matthew's mother. And father. They, obviously, they were there for, you know, the, the trials and everything. Um, before the sentencing trial, Matthew's mother entered the courtroom and said, let the hate stop here. Um, let's mm. just stop pursuing the death penalty. Um, oh, wow. But his father wanted them to die. <laughs> he wanted them to fry. Like, he flat out said, if I could have fried them both myself, I would have. I don't blame him and I don't blame her. Like, I see both of their their points and I see both of, like, they're grieving in very different ways, but their grief is still very valid and their process is still very valid for both of them. Yeah. This was the side note that I learned a little bit later on and I didn't really know where to put it, but I just wanted to insert it here. So um, Judy, his mom, actually said that Matthew was, like, very soon, like prior to his death, he was putting his life back together because he had actually taken a a high school trip to Morocco, like a senior trip, and he was gang raped by locals while on that trip. I I thought I knew about that. I don't know like the specifics behind it if he was targeted for being gay, like also there, but he was, I mean, with any type of sexual assault, that kills a certain part of you. And as a queer person, you don't want to report it. You don't want to talk about it because it can be so easily spun that like, it's even, I feel like it's worse for a queer person than a woman. Mm -hmm. 
in a lot mm-hmm. of ways where it's like you asked for it because you're gay. You yeah. like that. You like kinky stuff automatically because you're queer, you know? Mm-hmm. And he was in a foreign country True. at the time. True. Yeah. yeah. So there's like that whole oh, aspect. Mm-hmm. From what I remember, and like this is from a while back when I read about it, but it was. She talked about night. it in the book a little bit. Okay. But I didn't read okay. the book. Yeah. We will um, link I think that book was, also. Yeah. Um, I think he was walking at night. Um, and he just like, they came up behind him and I think threw him into some bushes and then gang raped him. And I think it affected him greatly for many years. And if I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, he came, he was starting to like really come out of his shell and come out of that trauma. Did I, ju- am I jumping the gun? No, Sorry. I was just about to go into yeah. that. Like his now, mom go into said it, go into it. that she felt like he was finally being himself again. Like he wasn't isolating and this is why it's so like frustrating because he was finally like brave and willing enough to go out that night and like have fun with his friends and meet new people and like try to relearn that the world is safe for him to like exist. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't. And it wasn't. No. Like that's the greatest tragedy of this whole thing is like he was finally on the journey for healing. Yes. Yeah. Finally getting it back. And for what? For what? Yeah. So October 12th, 1998, Matthew is still alive. So six days later, he's he's hung on for a bit. But his blood pressure was out of control. um, And he had a fever that had spiked pretty high. And his family chose to remove his ventilator once all of his friends and family were present in the room. And they were able to say what they needed to say to him and you know, hug him and hold his hand and everything. So he passed very shortly after the ventilator was removed and he was cremated and his parents took those home with them. Oh. Yeah. So sad. So the college that he was attending, why do I not have its name in here? Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Why don't I have its name in here? But the college he was attending... Um, actually honored his memory with a bench um, that Aww. stated, uh, or it still states, Matthew Wayne Shepherd, December 1st, 1976 to October 12th, 1998. Beloved son, brother, and friend, he continues to make a difference. Peace be with him and all who sit here. Mm. How lovely is that? That is lovely. <sighs> is that about the University of Wyoming? Yes. I, now that, yes. yes. I, say, I think that sounds right. That's what I thought oh it was, goodness. and I was... Like, I feel like it's wrong. I'm going to have to Google it real quick. <laughs> but yes. <laughs> um, so, wonderful honor. Um, October 16th of 1998 was the uh, funeral. And Casper City Council in Wyoming had banned pro- protesters like a couple of days prior. They're like, you guys can't show up to this. We've had a spectacle We don't need anything more. Like, this is too much for, like, the community, the family. We can't do it. So, and they were hoping to prevent another spectacle, but guess what? Guess who fucking showed up at the funeral? I know who you're going to say. Take a guess, please. I know who the fuck you're going to say, and I hate them with a passion. It's Westboro Baptist Church. I I have done the biggest of deep dives on that fucking oh. church and we will talk about them because I will cycle that back into actually doing a case over and I have it on my list that we're going to cover very shortly. Oh my Jessica, God. Jessica, what are your them. thoughts on the Westboro Baptist Church? I have no positive thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> they said don't. Don't go there. Okay. Don't take Protest, a step further. Drinking and the relentless. They are to, uh, yeah. why? awful. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, they actually. I mean, all protesters, I just don't know, understand why. I'm like, this is the time you could be doing something significantly different to mm-hmm. to benefit the things that you believe or you believe in your community, and instead you're so focused on this one element that really isn't changing or or resolving anything. It's like, you're you're. I'm still gonna. This is still gonna happen. You're still gonna be pissed, but you're just pissed in front of me, and we're still doing this in front of you. But <laughs> mm-hmm. you're, you're still well, pissed in front of me. We're still doing this. Yeah. <laughs> This is still going to happen. It's true. Yeah. We're going to just get them home. Yes. Yeah. Oh, gosh. So valid. So good. That That's and scripture, I, what you just said. That is yeah. scripture. It really is. It really is. And and I don't call them 
like the Westboro Baptist Church, they are a cult. And when I go over that case, you're going to see that it is an actual cult. Like I'm super excited to hear about it. So many. I hear their name all the time. I'm ready for a deep dive on it for sure. Oh, they are. Mm. And, and I even know somebody, uh, parasocially know somebody. We don't, we're not mutuals How or anything. Know so but many I know people. It's I so many actually bad knew places. them. They got out of they got out of the Westboro Baptist Church, and I followed them. Okay. They now are like they were super. They became a nurse. They were into fitness and like CrossFit, and they like make a whole bunch of money. And then now they have like an OnlyFans, and like they are full on living their life. I love following her. I love that. Yeah, she's good. Yeah, That's we'll great. talk about it more when I go on that case. But yeah, yeah, yeah oh, for I sure. hate them. <laughs> oh yeah, well mm-hmm. I can't think of a better yep. word. Um, they showed up and they had signs that read. I'm not even joking. Matt in hell, God hates fags. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. What? Straight, straight up. Yeah. We just, we won't even Mm -hmm. give them any more credit. But his parents had to wear bulletproof vest at his funeral. (gasps) Oh my God. I know. Just imagine like you're already, like you're in a dark place headspace and then someone walks up to you before you go in because you're like you just want to take a seat you just want to like take a breath um, yeah and because you've probably been talking to like a bunch of people that are like I'm so sorry I'm so, and it's like yeah I'm numb to this sorry doesn't do anything for me like a week almost in a week they're in a, a, a whole other country yeah mm-hmm. got back hounded immediately found this out about his son holds on for a couple of days it's just like a week of Relentless. Plus, mm-hmm. they've got investigators up their asses too, trying to get info on yeah. Matthew too. Probably. I mean, I'm assuming. Yeah. But if hell exists. Hell is th- that week to ten days that those parents had to walk through. That that is hell. That yeah. is true hell that mm-hmm. they had to walk through. That. I don't know if you have this in your notes, but I think I had heard something about p- uh, people actually like making comments and even calling the shepherd house and telling them. Like, God, you know, God killed your son. Yeah. Like, this was God's plan. They were completely, like, bombarded, berated for months, like, months after his death. They didn't have a second to just, like, grieve. Grieve. And be alone. Change the number or something like that, but that's ridiculous. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's like, if your religion is sending you down that path to where you're making a phone call to a grieving mother over her dead son and saying that God killed her son. No, yeah, that is not, that is not God. That is not any God that deserves to be worshiped. Yeah, your God is a piece of shit. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, really? Yeah, so, okay, now we're we're transitioning to a happier space though, okay? Okay, you know, let's go. All of this being said, Matt's parents, after the funeral and everything, they began working really hard trying to gain traction for, you know, the queer community, advocating for anybody that's in the LGBTQIA plus uh, world uh, to be safe, just being themselves. In 2009, they actually met President Obama. (laughs) So jealous. So fucking jealous right now. (laughs) Oh my gosh. What a flex. So good. What a flex. I know. For sure. Um, oh and that gosh. same year, uh, signed into federal law, was the Matthew Shepard and James Byrd Jr. Hate Crime Prevention Act. Yes, so, amen. I mean, he goes down in history, not not just because of his wounds, but like, he was able to make a difference. You know, his whole thing, his whole life was, I just want to leave the world a better place. He did. Mm-hmm. He did. He wanted to get into positions where he could make a change. And unfortunately, this is the way that it did, but he's lasted such a legacy in the positive realms of Mm -hmm. awareness, wisdom, and philanthropy, and Mm -hmm. uh, making his story not, again, about Mm -hmm. his wounds, his physical wounds. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. And kudos to his parents for being able to emotionally put themselves through that. Like, they have all the right in the world to sit in that grief and just live the rest of their life out, but they... They didn't have to do jack shit after this. Yeah, but they chose... They knew what their son wanted to do in this world, and they knew that with him being gone, the only way that that was going to happen was by them pushing it forward, and they did that, and they got the law passed, and they are they they are in history books now, or they at least should be in history books. 
So they will be. I will join the history book writers (laughs) board of directors and make it happen. I swear. Yeah. Um, Oh, but his parents weren't done yet. So they also started a foundation in his name to raise awareness and understanding for the LGBTQIA plus community. um, I love it. You know, create more understanding for the community, embrace diversity, and be able to just be safe. So yeah. uh, we're going to link that website if you want to donate to it. If you just want to check it yes. out, Matt's story is on there. Um, pictures of him and like his uh, memorial stuff is on there. So check it out. Absolutely. Love it. I mean, Matt's story, it lives on in a vibrant way. The way that he treated others and the way that others are now being treated in his name. Mm-hmm. Transcendent. That's God. Mm-hmm. That's the gospel. If that's all yes. you get from this, th- that's the Hallelujah. gospel. Um, there's a documentary by Film Rise True Crime that features Matt's story. And I got a lot of info from them. They interview a lot of like close friends of Matthews oh. and like um, detectives that were on the case and everything. And his parents are featured on there. Uh, they speak very candidly about the situation. Uh, especially yeah. his dad. His dad is such a vibe. Like, yeah, I love <laughs> I him. to go watch it just to see his dad. <laughs> yeah. So they they talk about his story. One of his friends that's on there was part of the LGBTQ um, A. Yes. That, yeah. Yeah. That association that he was part of. So that's really cool. So fast forward. Do you know if they interviewed the person that dropped him off at the bar? No, and I don't have her name, and like I don't. I don't know I what happened. Living with that as well. Oh, as, yeah. So I'm curious in this deeper dive if, if she's mentioned or if they had an interview with her and her experience in, in his last moments of like what that was like driving him to the bar. Yeah. I hope she's okay. I hope she's okay too. It's not your fault, honey. It's not. Absolutely not. Not at all. And But I can, I, it's human nature to to put that on ourselves and carry that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't have her name and I don't know whatever happened to her. I'm sure she was questioned by police and everything. Um, yeah. But she's not featured on the documentary. So, in 2018, Matthew's remains were entrusted to Washington National Cathedral. Wow. Resting, Shut up. resting beside former President Woodrow Wilson and Helen Keller. Shut what? your goddamn face. Damn. Helen Keller and who? Uh, uh, former President Woodrow Wilson. 